Well over a year ago, a friend shared this with me, and I'd been planning on putting it in a video for quite some time. And I thought, what better day to share this than on Columbus Day? Now this is a post that was in a group that a friend of mine belongs to, and when she shared this with me, I learned something new, and I absolutely loved it. And I hope you do too. It says, Depending on your age or your teacher, you were either taught that Columbus was a courageous man who dared to venture where others wouldn't, or an arrogant, iron-fisted tyrant who abused, murdered, and enslaved indigenous peoples in a selfish quest for gold and fame. In reality, he was a deeply spiritual and religious man who saw his role in history as one divinely appointed and directed. Historians agree that he was an astute and capable mariner and captain. His navigational skills were simply unparalleled, as was his record-keeping. Archives contain more than 80 letters, documents, and journals describing his voyages, a will and testament, over 2,500 handwritten margin notes in books he owned, and the Book of Prophecies, 168 pages of Columbus's thoughts and beliefs explaining the driving forces of his life supported with citations from the Bible and other sources. The Book of Prophecies has been largely ignored by scholars. It remained bound and unpublished for nearly 400 years. The first English translation was not published until 1991, just in time for the 500th anniversary of Columbus's first voyage. It opens, quote, Here begins the book, or handbook, of sources, statements, opinions, and prophecies on the subject of the recovery of God's holy city and Mount Zion, and on the discovery and evangelization of the Isles of the Indies, and of all other peoples and nations. Columbus's understanding of his mission came through diligent personal study of the Bible, the fire of the Holy Ghost, and on a few occasions, direct revelation. Quote, Our Lord unlocked my mind, sent me upon the sea, and gave me fire for the deed. Those who heard of my enterprise called it foolish, mocked me, and laughed. But who can doubt but that the Holy Ghost inspired me? Columbus began his sailing career at age 13 or 14 and acquired skills in mariner's arts, map-making, astronomy, geometry, arithmetic, geographies, histories, chronologies, philosophies, and other subjects. By age 30, he had sailed to Iceland, Ireland, and Africa. Somewhere on his many voyages, he became obsessed with the idea that there was a westward sea route from Europe to India. Quote, With a hand that could be felt, the Lord opened my mind to the fact that it would be possible to sail, and he opened my will to desire to accomplish the project. This was the fire that burned within me. Who can doubt that this fire was not merely mine, but also of the Holy Spirit, urging me to press forward? Historians assume he sought spices, gold, and fame, but he personally documents his two greatest motivations, the preaching of the gospel to all people and the recapture of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of its temple. Both steps had to happen before the Savior could return, and Columbus saw his voyages as the key to taking the gospel to all the world, while at the same time providing the wealth necessary to recapture Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. He wrote, I feel persuaded by the many and wonderful manifestations of divine providence that I am the chosen instrument of God in bringing to pass a great event, 
no less than the conversion of millions who are now existing in the darkness. So Columbus was not just seeking a voyage or an adventure or a quest. He was on a mission because God had called him. Quote, Of the new heaven and the new earth, of which our Lord spoke in the revelation of John, and earlier by the mouth of Isaiah, he made me the messenger, and he showed me where to go. And in a book printed in the 1800s, I came across this letter that Columbus wrote to the treasurer of Ferdinand, the king of Spain. Therefore, let the king and queen, the princes and their most fortunate kingdoms, and all other countries of Christendom, give thanks to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has bestowed upon us so great a victory and gift. Let religious processions be solemnized. Let sacred festivals be given. Let the churches be covered with festive garlands. Let Christ rejoice on earth as he rejoices in heaven. When he first sees coming to salvation so many souls of people hitherto lost, let us be glad also, as well on account of the exaltation of our faith, as on account of the increase of our temporal affairs, of which not only Spain, but universal Christendom will be partaker. Columbus never lived to see his dream of a great Christian realm in the New World or the temple rebuilt. At the end of his life, he was lonely, tired, discouraged, and deeply disappointed, but his faith was unwavering. Quote, I have done what I can, and now let it be left to the Lord our God to do it, whom I have always found very favorable and a very present help in trouble. In 1503, a celestial voice assured Columbus, quote, Since thou wast born, ever has he had thee in his watchful care. Whatever the version of his name, Cristoforo, Cristovio, Cristobal, or Christopher, the meaning is the same, Christ bearer. On the 20th of May, 1506, the day of the Feast of the Ascension, a priest was called who administered last rites, and Columbus whispered his final words, quote, In manus tauus domine, commendo spiritum miam. Or in other words, Into thy hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. No portrait of Columbus was painted during his lifetime. A few detailed descriptions of his appearance were left by those who knew him, and some of the portraits painted over the centuries are based on those descriptions. Others are purely imaginative. This is the only portrait of the discovery of America by an artist who claimed to have actually seen Columbus. Yuton William Parkinson. When asked, who he used as a model, Parkinson responded that he had used no one. Columbus had appeared to him during the night, and he painted the portrait immediately afterwards. Parkinson was reluctant to sell the painting because the inspiration meant so much to him. But he was near the end of his life and desired that the work be seen and shared. It is owned by Edward and Janie Rogers. I found this obituary for William J. Parkinson. He was born in 1899 and passed away in February of 1993. A member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, he studied art at the University of Utah and assisted greatly in the opening of the Springville, Utah Art Museum. I have a link down below in the video description if you'd like to check out his other artwork. I did a Google image search for this artwork and nothing came up. This might be the first time this image has ever been shown online. It very much depicts the opposite image of what history has shown us. A man who revered 
God, a man who recognized personal revelation from the Holy Spirit, a man who felt compelled to bring the gospel to the new world, and a man who God most certainly called to open up the way for the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ on the American continent.